When his deputy Brian Tallboys stepped down in 1980, Robert Muldoon controlled the election of his successor in typical style. Mr Muldoon announced, Mr Tallboys is not standing again as a member of parliament. It is therefore appropriate for us to elect a new deputy leader. Uh, we will do that next, caucus will do that next Thursday and the new deputy leader will be Duncan McIntyre. By now, Robert Muldoon presided over an unhappy government and stood for nothing except a need to control. But his formidable talents would still win the 81 election. He won because Labor fielded for a third time the tired Bill Rowling ticket. And because of two acts of great cynicism. He ran up vast debt on a package of Think Big projects dreamed up by officials on a trip with Muldoon to Bahrain. Some were disastrous, but together they gave the illusion there was a plan. Other than my which sort of said put the idea forward that we could sort of take these four or five projects and say, OK, look, let's put them as a, as a package, as it were, to try and restore confidence. That's why we're building them. That's why we're building them. Selling energy for overseas funds. It was um, uh, well sold, the whole government propaganda machine. Bill Birch was saying it's going to create 425,000 extra jobs, and uh, which is, you know, just absurd. But... Uh, people believed it. And Muldoon gambled that cultivating the Springbok tour issue and allowing the box to visit would make the difference in the provincial seats. He was right. He was still in control with a majority of one. They promised them everything. And finally the people said, no, nope, we don't believe you. And there's not going to be a change of government. However, Robert Muldoon's nemesis on the opposition benches was gathering strength. And stress, ill health and hard liquor were beginning to weaken his awesome power. New Year's Eve. Rob and Thea Muldoon are taking the waters at their annual holiday haunt, Hatfields Beach. Despite all, the Muldoons began 1982 presenting the usual picture of holiday relaxation. But for Robert Muldoon, the early 80s are the desperate years. By now, he has soured and cynicised most of the country. And as he prepares for his traditional state of the economy speech at Ottawa, it is increasingly plain that the Rob Muldoon economic miracle is a disaster. To give a significant reduction in personal income tax... Muldoon economics was becoming increasingly out of step with mainstream thinking. So there were difficult times within the party. They were very difficult times uh, for the government. Oh, they going to be more expensive? By 82, we are three times further in debt than Poland, four times more than Brazil. There is no plan, and he is using what is left of his economic brilliance just to hold power. The following is a statement by the Prime Minister. But then on June 2nd, 1982, Robert Muldoon took the desperate economic step which signalled his end. He now planned to control everything by regulations he announced on television. The government has passed regulations today to institute a wage and price freeze. And said to me, Mr. Galvin, I want to try some wage freeze in by Tuesday. And I said to the Prime Minister, come on, that's not the thing to do. I wrote the paper that tried to um, persuade him not to put the freeze on in 1982, which was a, a high point or perhaps a low point in my relationship with him. So I argued for three weeks, and three weeks afterwards, he rang me up on again on the Sunday and said, uh, Mr. Galvin, I've who do I am for the last three weeks and I've had other officials and can I have the regulation for Tuesday? <laughs> and he did. So at a time when New Zealand was a decade overdue for liberalisation, the great controller was convinced he had to personally direct all major elements of the economy. Overnight, Muldoon regulated all rents, all wages, all dividends, all interest rates and all prices. It was a bit like, uh, you know, fighting with a balloon. You grabbed one bit and it popped out somewhere else, so he then tried to grab that bit and it popped out again. Outside, the world looked at it and said, New Zealand's doing what? But that's what happened for nearly two years. The economy was just shrouded. Rebel Minister Derek Quigley, Quigley continued to criticise Muldoon's economics and was out. I've accepted the resignation of Mr D.F. Quigley from his cabinet post. Increasingly isolated, increasingly stressed, he continued to hold power in his last years by sheer guts and a web of control. And always there were the bizarre Muldoon contradictions. A Tory leader who now acted like an extreme socialist. A brilliant economic tactician with no vision or strategy at all. 
Tough on unions, but with no answers to Marsden Point and other weeping sores of the time. A reasonable Ferocious to enemies and yet capable of many small kindnesses to those who did not threaten him. Immensely rude to his senior public servants, but at the same time so proper, he could never bring himself to use their first name. Only once in the whole time of our year together did he call me by my first name, and that was in China, in 1976, when he was taken out to a, a briefing of the Gang of Four type of people, and about hours and hours and hours. And we, we got back to the place where we were staying, we went nice little place, and he said, Mr. Galvin, I'd like to see you in a minute. I went in there and he said, for heaven's sake, Bernie, get me a drink, have one yourself. <laughs> a man who claimed he never lied. The one firm rule is never tell a lie. Yet he did lie, but could never see it. Uh, he wouldn't have accepted that he told lies. I think he was absolutely committed to his own point of view and to his own infallibility. And so he would never have acknowledged that he told a lie, just as he never acknowledged that he was wrong. Even his much vaunted loyalty to colleagues was now abandoned to hold power. With a majority of one, he couldn't afford to lose any MPs, and he was prepared to sacrifice his obviously ill friend, Keith Allen. I uh, did talk to Muldoon about him. I said there was a need for uh, him to do something, that I had advised Keith to follow a certain course of action. And uh, when I talked to Muldoon about this, uh, he said to me, listen, he said, you look after the backbench, I'll look after the ministers, you keep away from Keith Allen. Filmed by television one night, stumbling home from Parliament full of drink and medication, a tragic Keith Allen was soon dead. By 1983, the economy was frozen and failing as never before, but the seeds of Robert Muldoon's destruction were germinating. I don't regard the fact that I haven't been in a cabinet as a handicap. In February, three-time loser Bill Rowling was replaced by a now slimmer, sharper David Longy. His brilliance and good humour meant Muldoon had his first serious rival since Kirk. And at Longy's shoulder was Roger Douglas, a Labour radical whose free market policies slammed everything Finance Minister Muldoon stood for. So we're going to concentrate on the future rather than be too concerned about the past. Pep talks with Muldoon would be caught in a pincer movement between the revitalised free market Labour Party and former friends who had become disgusted by Muldoon's economics and political style. Campaign New Zealand Party leader Mr Bob Jones limbers up on the punch bag at home. This week his performance in the political ring has drawn sizeable crowds. Whipped up by a charismatic Bob Jones, the New Zealand Party gathered many of National's natural supporters. And Muldoon was surrounded desperately trying to control an economy which even he now realised was beyond his control. In fact, he told uh, an ambassador here at the time, Ambassador, I don't know how we're going to get out of this. In other words, he used up all his options. Um, and there was a budget to be formed, uh, and uh, there's nowhere to go. These were days of despair. He would have been having tablets for blood pressure, and again, that's caused a lot by weight, plus, of course, stress. With his health failing almost as badly as the economy, he was dispirited and increasingly hitting the drink which would shorten his life. He was totally dependent on it just to really uh, to exist uh, in the last year or two. I mean, I, I saw him early one morning once and I thought he had Parkinson's disease and his whole body was shaking and he needed to steady himself, you know, so he was destroying himself, of course. Mm. 